Hello everyone, my name is Bedram and I'm a professor in data analytics. Welcome to another episode of Deep Learning. All right, module number five, deep computer vision. This is one of my favorite topics in the entire course. This is going to be a lengthy module and I'm going to do it in four parts. In part one, we will start with the very basics. Basically, we're going to see how computers actually see and what they see. And I will talk about why using fully connected layers is not enough and it's not sufficient in computer vision. In part two, we will talk about CNN, you know, convolutional neural networks, and we will investigate, you know, different architectures based on CNN. In part three, we will explore the idea of transfer learning and how pre-existing train networks can be utilized, right? And finally, in part four, we're going to get into more advanced topics and applications of deep computer vision. For example, we're going to look into object detection, semantic segmentation, and image captioning. So there are some models that we cover in that section. Basically, we're going to talk about regional-based CNNs, and we will say that's why we have to go beyond them. We will consider fast RCNN and faster RCNN. And then we'll also talk about the YOLO, you only look uh, once algorithm. And finally, for semantic segmentation, we're going to look into fully convolutional networks. All right, so it's going to be an exciting module. Uh, without further ado, let's get into that. So part one, deep computer vision basics. In order to deeply understand what is computer vision, I think it's a good idea to start from human vision. How do we actually see things as human beings, right? So let's see what's going on in our brain. Imagine, here's a, here's a picture, right? So imagine there is this picture of a flower here. And then there's going to be some light from this picture that goes to our, into our eyes, right? The first thing that is going to focus that light is called retina. And the retina is going to transform those lights into electrical signals and send it to the back of the brain uh, using some nerves called optic nerves. At the back of the brain, there is this thing called visual cortex. And the visual cortex is actually is responsible uh, for interpreting those electrical signals sent by retina. Overall, the visual cortex is able to see images by receiving and interpreting those signals and then processing those information to extract meanings and understanding from the data, from the image out there, right? The cool thing is that this visual cortex is made up of several different layers, different areas, if you wish. And each of those layers uh, has a specific role in processing visual uh, information. So this, this is really important because what we're going to construct in computer vision is quite analogous what how the visual cortex is working. Let's see what are these components in the visual cortex. So the first one is something called V1. Now this is a primary visual cortex and that V1 is going to receive inputs from the retina and it's responsible for early processing. So this is at the very first early processing of visual information, such as edge detection and basic object recognition, for example, horizontal line, vertical line, and things like that. And then V1 is going to pass the information to the next layer, which is V2. V2 received those inputs from V1, and it's responsible for more advanced processing, right? So this is, a, as you can see, it's a hierarchical process. Then those more advanced processings are, for example, something such as color and texture processing. And then as you can guess, V2 is going to pass this information to V3, and V3 is responsible for even more advanced processing like spatial relationship and depth perception. So this hierarchical uh, uh, process is very interesting because as you can see, the more complex pattern is down in the later layers. So this means that the specific neurons will react to a specific part of the image. And this is exactly how we're going to construct our neural network layers to process images or information. Now that we know what is human vision, let's see what is computer vision. So computer vision involves the development of algos and systems to enable computers to see, understand, and interpret the visual world. You know, historically, the study of computer vision is not is relatively new, you know, and it can trace it back to 1950s. But the field truly took off with the development of digital cameras and maybe cheap computing powers in 1990s. 
So the applications of computer vision is huge. You know, it can go from robot, robotics, medical imaging, surveillance, augmented reality, image and video analysis. And as you can see, the computer vision is a rapidly growing field that has the potential to revolutionize many areas of technology and the society around us. Now, let's see, what do the computers see, right? So we said that we as the humans, we are going to use our eyes to detect light. The retina is going to transform those lights into electrical signals and send it back to the visual cortex, and the visual cortex is going to process things. But in computers, the things are different, right? So computers don't have retina, but they have sensors such as cameras, the scanners, or I don't know, the, the, something like that to capture images, right? Then computers are going to convert those images into digital representations, right? So what are these digital representations? You can think of it as just grid of pixels, right? So each of these uh, pixels has a numerical value assigned to that based on their based on the color and intensity of the light that is uh, observed fr from the image, right? So for example, this is a 12 by let me write it down 12 by 16 image. Uh, from Abraham Lincoln, and then we can assign a number to each pixel. So, for example, this is a number assigned to this pixel, and etc. This is a number assigned to this pixel, and etc. Right? So, depending on color and intensity of the light from this picture, we're going to assign a number between 0 and 255, right? And then we're going to summarize it in a matrix. So, here is going to be a 12 by 16 matrix, and these are basically some numbers. So, this is at the end of the day what the computer is going to see. Okay, nothing like an image. Basically, it's a representation of that. It's a digital representation of an image. Then by analyzing these pixels, the computers can recognize, detect, and categorize different images. So this is what computers see. Now, in the next slide, let's see how they see things. Just like what happens in the visual cortex, the computer the learns features in a hierarchical manner as well. Remember, in visual cortex, we had V1, V2, V3 to capture you know, low-level features and in a hierarchical manner to get to the high-level features. In computer vision, this, the process is exactly the same. So if you have a raw data, the idea is that without doing any kind of feature engineering, so we don't need to hand engineer the features, so this is going to be done automatically. And then at different layers, we're going to extract different features. So at the first layer or first couple of layers, we're going to extract low level features like what are the edges? What are, for example, the horizontal line, uh, vertical line and things like that. Right. So this is analogous to what we did uh, in the V1 uh, of the visual cortex. Right. Then in the next layer, so we can think of it as V2 if you want to compare it to human brain. Uh, the we are, uh, next layer is responsible for you know mid-level feature detection like eyes and nose and ears in this in this image for example and then finally in the last layer or let's you can think of it this is analogous to v3 uh, we are doing some high level feature extraction and remember it's important to notice that this feature extraction it's done automatically there's no need to do it uh, by hand so no hand engineering features required and the output of this computer vision network is going to be high level feature detection so at the end of the day the, the input is an image the output is just high level features now we can pass those high level features to let's say fully connected layers and make a prediction based on that right so at the end of the day we are going to pass these high level features we can flatten them and we can pass them to some couple of dense layers and maybe we can do some, uh, this is the output layer, we can do some classification. Okay, at this part of the course, you should be quite familiar with the deep neural networks and what are the fully connected, connected networks, right? You might wonder why we cannot use those networks to process image data, right? Theoretically, the answer is you can, but practically, no, you know, you should not, right? Let, now let's see why. So imagine here's a picture of a dog and it's a color picture. So it means that we have, let's say it's a 1200 by uh, 800 pixel picture and we have three channels. So if you want to do the math to see what is the size of the tensor, so we have 1200 by 1800 by three channels RGB. So I need to multiply this by three. So if you do the math, you're going to get 2.88 million. So for this simple single image, you're going to have 2.88 million values, right? So if I want to flatten this, how can I do that? So imagine this is the first stack of pixels. I can, I don't know, I can transform it. V2, 
vertically, right? something like this, and then the second one, and the third one, and etc. Right? So we are talking about 2.88 million values. And now just simply assume that in the next layer, we're simply adding 10 more neurons, right? So if I do that, then I have to multiply these 2.88 to 10 neurons. So I, I'm going to get 28 million parameters. So as you can see, the network is going to get out of control very fast. And the number of parameters are going to be many, many parameters, right? So another thing that we're going to lose by flattening, flattening the information is that we're going to lose spatial information. So this is also important. So as you can see, when I flatten things like this, we are completely losing the spatial information because, you know, for example, here we have eyes, right? And then in the next layer, we have something close to eyes. But if I flatten them, flatten them I'm going to lose this spatial information. So we have to go beyond fully connected layers. There, there must be a way to, to fix these problems. First of all, we want to avoid these so many parameters. And secondly, we want to make sure that this architecture that we're designing is able to preserve spatial information. And this is where CNN shines. You know, convolutional neural networks are basically a neural network architecture that do two things for us. First and most important, it pres preserves spatial structure. And secondly, it requires a lot fewer parameters. And actually what we can say here is that each neuron is going to see a patch of pixels instead of seeing the entire vectorized image, right? So we also call this local feature extraction. So let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. So imagine this is your entire image. And if I want to flatten this entire image and then pass it to one neuron, uh, I will, that single neuron is going to get input of 2.88 million values, right? But we're not going to do things like this. We're going to say that let's construct uh, something called filter. So, and this filter is going to tell us what are the features, right? So for example, I call it filter one and it has some, uh, it's a matrix, right? It's a three by three matrix and it has some values in it. And for example, one filter is designed to capture a line like this. One filter is designed, so this is for edge detection or line detections, right? Then I can take that filter and pass it through the entire image. I'm going to roll it over the entire image like this. And wherever there's an edge, this filter is going to detect that edge and it's going to fire a neuron, right? So this is very different compared to a case that we are doing fully connected networks and we're going to pass the entire pixels, vectorized pixels uh, to one neuron, right? So that's, that's a big difference. I'm going to be more specific about the filters and all these terminologies in the future slides. But for now, just remember the CNNs are the composed of multiple layers of nodes that each of them are going to extract specific features from the input image. And one last thing uh, is that CNN were first introduced in 1980s, but they became more popular when they had, we, we had the computation power and we had access to millions or billions of records of labeled data. Now let's look into the CNN architecture at a very high level. A CNN typically consists of uh, four different layers, right? Four different types of layer. The first one is the input layer. And then there is one or more uh, convolutional layers in between. And again, one or more uh, pooling layers after that. And one or more fully connected layers at the end. Then we're going to pass this information to the output layer and make some predictions, right? So the convolutional layers are responsible for extracting features. So this is what happens at the beginning, right? So this is the image. And we have a bunch of fil filters. And those filters are going to be stacked in the convolutional layers. And the, the goal of this step is to extract some high level features, right? So this is, so for example, this is what we get, right? And then the pooling layers are responsible to downsample those features because we want to make sure that when we pass it, when we flatten these things, the number of parameters is not getting out of control. So we are going to use a bunch of pooling layers after each convolutional layer to downsample the feature maps. And then finally, we're going to pass those things to the fully connected layer. So we're going to, we're going to flatten things, right? And those fully connected layers are responsible for classifying the features extracted by the CNN, right? So we can, for example, this, we can add another fully connected layers and another output layer. And basically we're going to make some predictions. What is a convolution? 
So this is going to be an important slide, so I want you to pay good attention. Uh, so convolution is a simple mathematical operation which is used to extract features from images. So what does that mean? So imagine this blue thing here is our 5x5 five five original picture. So this is our input. 5x5 five five pixel picture, which of course is low resolution, but imagine it's, uh, it's showing a dog, right? So imagine there's a dog here in the blue one. We're going to do something to this input, right? And that's something, let's for now, let's call it convolution. And we're going to apply that operation to this input layer to get to something called feature map. So this is our feature map. Okay. How does the feature map look like? If you're using some filters for edge detection, so this feature map is going to be the same picture of this, uh, the picture of the same dog, but now the edges are highlighted, right? So depending on what kind of filter we're using, uh, different pixels of this output, uh, of the input image is going to be highlighted and sent to the feature map, right? So here we're designing the, this operation such that the output, the feature map has the same size as the input, right? We can change these things, right? Usually we, when we're applying the convolution, usually the size is going to decrease, but we can apply this convolution in a way we can slide these windows such that uh, the, the feature map shape is the same as the input map, uh, input page, uh, input uh, uh, image, right? So now with that, let's look into the more details. So convolution involves taking a small matrix of numbers and those matrix of numbers, you can think of it as filter or sometimes called kernel. It can be something like three by three, as we have here, you know, as you can see, this sliding matrix is a three by three, right? So let's say, for example, this filter is a three by three thing matrix. These are some numbers, right? It can be one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and minus one, things like that, right? We're going to talk about the details of these filters in the next slide. But for now, let's imagine it's, it's a simple three by three matrix. We're going to take that matrix and and slide it over the entire input image. So what does this mean? It means that we're going to multiply these numbers, these nine numbers, to nine numbers from the input image, right? So let's say this is the first one. Remember, in the input image, these are original pixels, right? These are this is what actually computers see. It can be a number between 0 and 255. We are doing things such that we want to make sure, that, again, the, the size of the input is the, size, is the same as the size of the feature map. So that's why we're adding these things called padding. So we're going to assign zeros to these white cells, uh, white grids, and then now do a simple multiplication, right? So it's, it's a, we're going to perform an element-wise multiplication. So imagine, I'm just for the sake of argument, these numbers are 10, 25, I don't know, 50, and etc., 60, something like that. I'm going to take this matrix, multiply it by this filter, and I will slide this over the entire input image, right? So the result of this multiplication is going to be summed up, and it forms an output the, of the convolution at that position, right? So for example, this multiply a 3 by 3 matrix is going to give us this cell, okay? We're going to repeat this process for the entire input image and to get to something called feature map. So the output of this process is the feature map. Again, this is which is a modified version of the input image that has been transformed by the filter, by the kernel. Okay. So again, we start from a simple image here. We did something to that. We call it convolutional operation based on a filter. And then we get an output called feature map. In this example, it happens to be the feature map has the same size as the input map. Okay, what is a filter? A filter or kernel is a small matrix of weights that is used in CNN to extract features from images, such as edges, corners, patterns, and etc. Remember, the filter is nothing fancy. It's just a three by three or five by five, usually a matrix. And then we can use multiple of those features or filters to extract different features from the same input, right? So imagine, for example, I have an image input and then at the first layer, I'm going to use 32 filters. In the next layer, I'm going to use 64 of these filters. And then I'm going to do 128 of those filters and etc. right? So we can apply many of these filters to the same input image to extract a variety of features from the same input. Okay. Now let's look at some examples of these filters and these matrices, matrices and it should make more sense. 
So for example, uh, we have an image of a squirrel. This is the input image, right? So this is the original input image. And now we're going to apply some of these uh, filters to that. So the first one is, you know, there, there are many of them that we can hand engineer. So the first one is the identity uh, filter, right? Or operation. And basically the idea is that it's a three by three matrix and all of the elements are zero except the one at the, at the uh, middle, right? So if I apply this filter, and if I do uh, point-wise multiplication of this filter over the entire image pixel, I will get back the same image. So if you're curious, how does that happen? Let me give you an example. Imagine we have a four by four input image. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So this is a four by four original input image. And I wanna do this convolutional operation. I'm gonna apply this filter such that the output is also four by four. Imagine that's the case, right? So imagine this is what we're interested. If you wanna do something like this, I have to add uh, also padding as well. So we're gonna look into the idea of padding later on, but the idea is that I can go ahead and apply this three by three filter. I'll start from here, okay? So let me actually use some dashed lines to make sure that you're following the padding. So these are the paddings that I add to make sure that after applying these filters, I get the same size output feature map, right? So this is my three by three. So look at the screen, trying at uh, the green square. This is a three by three filter. And look at that, we are applying zeros. We're multiplying zeros to all elements, except the middle one, which is one. So what I get by this multiplication, I get the original number of the pixel, right? So let's say that original number was 10. I don't know what is it, but let's say that was 10, right? Then if I apply, if I slide over this uh, filter and then apply, I move it uh, one, uh, one pixel to the right, one grid to the right, I get this one. If I do this one, I get this one and etc. right? So the thing is that if we slide this over the entire image, we get back the original pixel numbers from the image, right? So this means that if I apply this identity matrix, uh, not identity matrix, identity filter, uh, to the input image, I'm gonna get back the same input. So this means that this image that you're seeing, this is the original image. Now, if we change the numbers on this matrix, we get different filters, right? And based on different filters, we get different feature maps. So for example, these are some matrix from filters that we use for uh, the edge detection, right? So it means that if I multiply these numbers, by let's say, for example, these numbers, I get different values, right? And then the feature map is gonna look like something like this. So again, the input is the original image like this. The output is the feature map if I apply that filter. If I apply, and of course you can see we can uh, focus more on the center and then this is going to be, the edges are gonna be more highlighted here, right? Then I, again, for example, we have a sharpen filter. If I apply this matrix and doing a convolutional operation on the input image, I get something like this. Now the picture is sharpened. I can use blur filter. So if I do the blur filter, I get something like this. So as you can see, each of these filters are gonna give you different feature maps, right? So what are the numbers in these filters? It's absolutely difficult to hand engineer these things, right? So if, uh, for example, you're, you, you're gonna use hundreds of thousands of filters down the road, but do you literally want to hand engineer these numbers in these matrices? The answer is no. And this is actually the beauty of CNN, which enables us to figure out these features automatically from the data, right? So this means that whatever filter you have, so let's say you have a three by three filter, three by three, right? So how many values there is in this filter? There's going to be nine. So these are going to be the parameters of the model that the model is gonna learn down the road, right? So the model is gonna figure out what are the weights of these parameters that is gonna give you, for example, edge detection or things like that, right? So this is at the very abstract level. Uh, the, the details are, of course, more involved, but I think, I, I hope that you get the, you understand that what is the, uh, what is the point of filters and what do we mean that networks are gonna learn the parameters? The parameters are basically the weights of these filters, right? These are the weights of the network. Okay, here's just one last example to make sure that you're understanding the convolutional operation with a numerical example, right? So let's say there is this input size six by six, 
and these are the original pixels, the numbers. And as we said earlier, the CNN is going to do something called local feature extraction. It's going to focus on the patch of pixels that, and it's going to slide it over the entire image, right? So let's say we have a filter size three by three and we are going to focus on this, this part of data first. And we're going to do element wise multiplication. So literally if I multiply these numbers and add them, of course, all of them, right? And add them, I get number 31, right? So one plus zero plus three plus zero plus five plus six plus seven. I'm just rolling it over, right? Plus seven plus zero and plus nine. If you do the math, you should get number 31, right? And we're going to repeat this process for the entire image. This is our output image, which is also we call it feature map. Feature map. All right. And here is just a visualization of that. So hopefully uh, now you have a better sense that what is this convolutional operation and uh, what do we mean by that? Before wrapping up this section, let's talk about some of the parameters of the filter that control the way in which the filter is applied to an input image during the convolutional operation. So these parameters are size, stride, and padding. Okay? They're very simple concepts. The size uh, of a filter refers to the dimension of that kernel, right? So we can have a filter of size 3 by 3, 5 by 5, right? So this is our filter. So imagine this is the input image. The input image is a 6 by 6 thing. We're going to apply a 3 by 3 filter to that. So the size of the filter is 3. Then the next concept is stride. Stride refers to the number of pixels that the kernel is moved at each step, right? So basically, for example, here on the left image, we have something like this. If we start from here and then we go to the next one, as you can see, we are moving this kernel just by one, uh, for one unit, right? So this is where the stride is equal to 1. And if I start from here, I, and if you move things by two pixels, or by, yeah, by two grids, then the stride is equal to number two. So here, in this example, the filter size is three, and the stride is two. In this example, and the one on the left, the filter size is three, and the stride is number one, right? And as you can see, we can apply these uh, convolutional operations, we get different, different numbers in the output, right? So here, look at the result or the feature map. The feature map here is a 4x4 four four thing. Here is a 2x2 two two thing. It, this is, the, the reason that it's happening is that because we are applying a larger stride to, 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 to the picture on the right-hand side, right? So the larger the stride, it will, results in a smaller output image. Basically, if I actually, do, we're going to see that uh, if I use stride is equal to 2, I'm literally, uh, you know, roughly halving the input size, right? There are different ways to down sample uh, to downsize the input. One of them is a stride. The other one is later on. We're going to talk about the pooling operation. Okay, so this is the size versus a stride. Another thing that we can think of is the idea of padding, right? So uh, remember here the padding is zero because we're not adding any cushion or padding, if you wish, around the input image, right? So the same idea here. There is no padding here. And remember why we may want to do padding because we want to make sure that the size of the output is the same as the size uh, of the or the dimension of the output is the same as the dimension of the input right so that's the idea of size stride and padding so as i said padding refers to this idea of adding extra pixels around the border of an input image so for example here we have here have a padding of size one so the padding is one so the size of the filter is three so we this uh, red um, square is a three by three this stride that we're going to use we can use two right so we can say the next one let me use red the next one is something like this and the next one is something like this and etc the next one is something like this. So here's an example where the stride is equal to two, filter size is three, and padding is equal to one, right? So we use padding to preserve the spatial dimension of the input image and basically to control the size of the output image. So imagine your input is a, I don't know, 32 by 32, and you want to make sure that after applying the convolutional operation, the feature map is also 32 by 32, right? So if you want to do that, you have to apply some padding. Then this is important because when you're building deeper networks, 
uh, we need to make sure that the dimension of the input image is not shrinking dramatically, right? So also know that the padding will help us to keep more of the information at the borders, because if we don't do apply paddings, then the border the pixels are not going to be, uh, let's say, the, as important as the pixels in the middle of the picture, right? So for that reason, we can apply padding too. So here is the... Uh, there, there are different uh, terminology when we are applying paddings uh, to the convolutional layers. One is valid padding and the other one is same padding. So the valid padding, the name is a little confusing, but it comes from the fact that if you're using all the original pixels in the data, it's called valid padding. So valid padding, you can think of it as no padding. So if I use this green uh, square, basically literally if I use the valid values of the pixels in the image, then this is no padding. Then same padding is a terminology that they use to preserve the input dimension. So we have to calculate these numbers, right? So for example, the same padding, uh, you have to see that what is the number of that P should be? Is it two? Is it three? Is it one? What it should be to make sure that the output, the feature map has exact dim dimension as the input. All right, so if you're wondering what is the relationship between these parameters, you know, size, stride, and padding, you're on the right track, right? So for example, why we go from a six by six matrix, you know, input uh, to a three by three output, how do we do these calculations? What is the relationship between, you know, the number of the dimension in the input image and F and S and P and basically how we calculate the size of the output image or dimension of the output image, right? So let's do this in the next slide. Let's see how we can calculate the output dimension. Dimension. So practically speaking, you never need to do these things manually. You don't need to memorize this formula or, or anything like that. But the idea is that when you are doing the Python part of this module and you are looking at the summary of your CNN architecture and you're wondering, OK, how we went from this input dimension to that output dimension or how the number of parameters were calculated in this neural networks. So in order to answer those questions, you, this, this is the right place, right? You should, you should at least see where those numbers are coming from. But it's nothing complicated. The, the formula may seem a little daunting, but it's nothing complicated. So the idea is that basically it says that the dimension of the output, so let's say this is layer, convolutional layer number L, uh, depends on a bunch of stuff, right? So what was the dimension of the input? So this is the dimension of the layer, the previous layer, right? So this is, let's think about it as the input dimension. Plus, uh, the, this is what we're, what we're gonna use padding, two multiply padding in the previous layer, minus what we are using as a filter size, divided by the stride and we have to add number one to that and look at the floor of it right so look at the integer part of it right so if you look at the numerical example it makes a lot more sense so imagine we have the input uh, shape is six right and you want to figure out what is the output shape so what is this thing so the output shape you know it's going to be something like this i will look into first of all what was the size of this input it was num no, number six then what was the padding? The padding we use zero. So we're going to say two multiply zero. Then what was the filter size itself? The filter size was three. And then we divide it by stride. So the number of stride here is only one. And then we add back number one and we look at the floor of this thing, right? So it's six minus three plus one. So the floor of this thing is number four. So the output is going to be a four by four matrix. Okay. So as you can see, if I go ahead and change this stride, so this is, if, if you go back to the previous slide, that's where the four by four output in the feature map is coming from. In the previous slide, we also look into another example when the uh, filter size was three, padding was zero, and also the stride was equal to two. If I use these numbers, what I get? I get 6 plus 2 multiply 0 minus 3 divided by 2 now plus 1. And look at the floor of it. So what do we get? We get 1.5 plus 1, 2.5. And the floor of this thing, we get 2. So this is where the 2 by 2 matrix was coming from in the previous example.
All right, let's conclude this part by going over how CNN operates at the very high level, right? So in the next part of module five, I'll talk about the details of these operations. So it's sort of like this. During training, a CNN is presented with a set of labeled training examples. It can be thousands or up to, I don't know, millions of images, right? Then the network process these images through a series of layers. Remember, we can have input layers, and we have convolutional layers, pooling layers, fully connected layers, and then finally an output layer, right? So then specifically in the convolutional layers, there are some filters. These filters are used to extract features from the input image, right? So this is an input image. We're going to apply some filters, and those filters are extracting uh, some features from the input image. And the filters are updated during training process in order to learn the features that are relevant for a particular task. So imagine, for example, here in the convolutional layer, we have, I don't know, 32 filters, 64 filters, right? And each of these filters are designed to capture uh, some level of abstraction of the of the input image, right? So, for example, capturing the uh, low-level features. So, for example, edges and borders and lines and things like that, right? And remember, these filters themselves are updated. So, what was a filter? It was a matrix of three by three. These are some parameters, nine parameters. These parameters are updated during the training. So, the whole point of doing CNN is to find these filters, you know, feature maps automatically extract these features automatically. We don't need to do hand engineering things, right? So the output of the CNN is then compared to the true label. So here's your input. We're going to do apply some filters. And based on that, we're going to do some pooling operation. Then we're going to do some fully connected layers. And then let's say we have some output layer with an activation function of, uh, let's say, a softmax you know we want to figure out if for example this picture is a is it a bear is it a dog is it a cat what it is right and then there's an output let's say the output is bear okay then this is this is your prediction this is what the model predict and we have a true remember the data was labeled so we have a true y as well so we're going to go ahead and calculate the error right so the error is calculated and then based on that error we're going to back propagate through the network and the weights which happens to be the, the numbers in the filter matrix are going to be updated and are going to be adjusted in a way that we are minimizing the error, we are minimizing the cost function. So, and then this process is repeated uh, for the entire training examples and the filters are updated accordingly. So that's the entire process of the CNN, you know, how CNN operates at the very high level. All right, that's it for today. This was part one of module five, the deep, deep computer vision. We covered the very basics of computer vision. We talked about what it is, how computers see, see things, and why we should go beyond fully connected networks. So in the next one, we will talk about CNN architectures and the details, and we will specifically focus on different types of convolutional operation. Until the next one, take care.